Hello, welcome to this playthrough, first look at the game 80 Days, based on, I suppose, Jules Verne's book Around the World in 80 Days, it was Jules Verne I think, and I haven't played the game before, this is strictly a first look at it, and um, We'll see how it goes. If you're interested in playing the game, well, then you can watch my mistakes and see how it goes. See what you think. And I don't know whether to just start. It was apparently, I think it was Time Magazine's Game of the Year for something like um, nine, uh, 2014. And, it's, and as I say, it's based on the book Around the World in 80 Days, set, as you can see, 1872 when our character or characters decides to go around the world. I think this is kind of like a, a steampunk version of it, though, but still. Um, and it's a text-based game, I think. So, <clears throat> let's see. There's, there's two characters at least, and maybe others. I'll, maybe I'll try and do the voices, shall I? <laughs> I have entered into the service of a new gentleman. It would seem... How do I do this? Click. Oh, he is a gambling man. Oh. Oh, what is happening? Do I click on it? Yes. Oh. Directed by, is it a movie? I like it so far. <laughs> do I do something? Click to begin. I recognize these buildings. Monsieur Phileas Fogg returned home early from the Reform Club, and in a newfangled steam carriage besides, I helped him down. And the iron-lunged, steam-driven horses clattered away. Pass partout, said he. We are going around the world. Around the world, monsieur? Uh, I asked, utterly astonished. We shall circumnavigate the globe within 80 days. He was quite calm as he proposed this wild scheme. I suppose I should do that bit in Passepartout's voice, shouldn't I? Because he's, he's a French servant. He was quite calm as he proposed this wild scheme. We leave for Paris on the 8.25 in an hour. You are in jest, I told him in dignified affront. You make mock of me, monsieur. <clears throat> I am quite serious. Pack an altimeter and my evening jacket. There is not a moment to waste. You, Passepartout, now have the funds. Your character is now polished. What on earth does that mean? How do I pack? Oh, pack. There we go. The altimeter. European shipping timetable would seem reasonable. Wax cylinder. Evening jacket. Well, I think I need that, being a gentleman. I'm packed. Okay. It's 
So, I have some choice of how on earth to get around the world. <clears throat> Depart. Tritam, Fitri, <coughs> and Fitri, I don't know. <coughs> the mechanical horses raced past Piccadilly Circus and Pall Mall faster than the team of Starbridge. So, even saw so, the whistle as the 825 was blowing as we pulled up to Charing Cross Station. We have no tickets, I exclaimed. We raced along the concourse and threw ourselves aboard as the second whistle shrieked its warning. We barely had time to take our seats before the guard rapped smartly on the compartment door. He held out a hand. Tickets, please. Alas, monsieur, we were in a great hurry. I explained, giving him a beseeching look. We did not have time to buy tickets. <coughs> you may purchase them from me, the guard was, sa the, the guard was saying. Though it is more expensive, I'm afraid. Eighty-five pounds, please. Mm. Ugh. This is England. You cannot argue with these idiots. Uh, I handed over the eighty-five pounds and smiled a thin smile from one working man to another. The guard gave me our tickets and slid the compartment door shut behind him with a pneumatic hiss. Your funds have gone down somewhat. Converse. I am at your service, Monsieur Fogg. Pass par two. But tell me, Monsieur, what is the purpose of our journey? I have made a hefty wager, and I do not intend to lose. Very good. London smog gave way to rolling hills and the pastures of the Kentish countryside, still untouched by the hand of technological advancement. Monsieur Fogg read his paper whilst I repacked our bags, thrown together in haste and confusion. As afternoon turned inexorably to evening, I discovered that my master was one of those gentlemen who broke their silence rarely, if at all. A guard rapped on our door a few miles before Dover. We're about to submerge, he warned. Take some people a bit funny, so watch out. What do you mean, submerge? I cried. This is the London to Paris Amphitrite Express, he explained, as though to a particularly dim-witted child. The submersible train! Oh, that's his accent. The submersible train? Talk of all the London papers. Then this is the mare train, I exclaimed. He made a face. Bloody journalists and their silly names, he muttered. Every inch of her has been examined and stamped with the artificer's seal. This is the world's only Bath Escape locomotive. I pressed my face to the window glass as the fins above the amphitrite's wheels extended with a hydraulic hiss. Night fell as we plunged past the end of the track into the freezing water of the English Channel. La Manche, as, as the French call it. Huh? The amphitrite ploughed through the water overnight and splashed up onto wider gauge French tracts at Calais as dawn broke. Do you have a route in mind, monsieur? I asked as the water of the Channel dried from the compartment windows. <laughs> I am as yet undecided, my master, my master admitted. The new canal has sped up the shipping route from Suez to Bombay, though perhaps we could take the Trans-Siberian Railway across Russia. Oh. Surely not Bombay, I exclaimed. We shall certainly wilt in the scorching heat. Then we would do well to buy hats and linen trousers, he replied. 
There are other alternatives. We may also travel overland and across the Black and Caspian Seas. But which is the safest? Monsieur Fogg raised an eyebrow. There is no place in the world which is not safe for an Englishman, he said coolly and with great finality. Pableu! I scarcely knew what to think. We arrived at Paris Gare du Nord just after one o'clock. <clears throat> Automaton porters lifted our luggage and then our persons onto the platform with long, delicately filigreed iron arms. Paris, city of my heart. I was home, but not to stay. Possessions would trade well here. to find some way to get somewhere, huh? Yeah. We had a few hours to spare. I asked Monsieur Fogg if I might enjoy my city before we had to leave. Indeed. And should you learn anything of note, anything of note, be sure to relay it. I nodded and headed into town. The talk on the streets was of one thing only, an enormous, elegant, oval stadium constructed upon the green fields of Champ de Mars and containing the technological marvels out amusement parks and milling crowds of the World's Fair of 1872. But I was certain Monsieur Fogg did not intend for me to visit fairs. Oh, oh, I ventured inside. Oh, I ventured inside. The grand illuminated pavilions of the exposition. An artificer was replacing an arclight. I went west towards the airship hangar, past a booth with a husband and wife pair selling panoramic hot air balloon rides to eager tourists. I inquired as to the hourly rate, wondering if perhaps the balloon could be encouraged to go a little way east as well and contribute to our great journey. Eighty pounds for a half-hour flight, as the man responded. Hmm. Not today, I think, I replied swiftly. The man nodded and moved on to the next punter with great swiftness. I regarded the airships that filled the hangar behind him. 
there were a huge number on display from all over the world and my eye was immediately caught by Ooh. the metal clad full propeller Savarka atomic with its red and yellow painted hull. They use the power of the sun, you know, remarked the lady at the stand. Remarked the lady at the stand, even. No fuel at all? A little. For takeoff and for emergencies. They have rainy seasons in India and they don't want their whole fleet grounded. Atomics such as this sails the skies of British India, near the Delhi home of their inventor, Amulya Savarkar. Perhaps one day soon Monsieur Fogg and I would find ourselves flying in such a craft? I return to the exposition centre, my thoughts turning with clouds and engine rotors. Avenues sprawled in every direction between the inviting illuminated pavilions of the exposition. I decided to take my leave. And I returned to Monsieur Fogg, who was eating a meal of plain boiled beef à l'anglaise. Did you enjoy the exposition? my master inquired. My master inquired diffidently. And I nodded. Will we travel by airship, do you suppose? I asked. I think it's highly likely, he replied. They're expensive, but extremely fast. I dreamed that night of mechanical wonders and automatons with beautifully enameled faces. Knowing little of the strange inventions and stranger peoples I would soon encounter in my journey around the world. The clock is ticking, Passepartout. We must decide our next steps quickly. for this, but I haven't any instructions. All right, so that's what we'll do. We took a hotel for the night. We'll be comfortable here. Monsieur Fogg remarked, but travelling overnight will often be more efficient. Where possible. Where possible. Where possible, I said. We cannot travel where it is not possible, certainly, he replied. Still, the surrounds of the Hotel Ritz were most enjoyable. Depart. the Orient Express was altogether calmer a cal was an altogether calmer affair than our race through London had been. Mechanical porters loaded us in through the windows, then snapped them shut with a delicate click. 
the train will be the first leg of a much longer journey, however, so there was little use in growing too comfortable. Indeed, he could only take us as far as Vienna. Our last long whistle blew, and we began our journey east. Balloonist kidnappers exposed at World's Fair. Ho ho ho. Lucky we did not choose that one, huh? My master wished to be undisturbed, so we left Paris. So as we left Paris, I left him and went to explore the train. There was a delightful dining car and an observation deck formed by the replacement of an entire compartment with an open glass cube. I stopped there watching the scenery flash past and as I, as I stood, a portly gentleman with a quivering luxuriant moustache struggled by carrying several trunks. I offered him my aid and he introduced himself after a shower of thanks. Henri de Blowitz, Blowitz, foreign correspondent of the Times. Are you working, monsieur? I asked, and to my delight he assured me he was. I am! He patted his breast pocket. The stories that you hear, it seems everywhere is on the brink of one revolution or another. Everywhere there is progress. But who will count the costs? That sounds most ominous, I told him. Does it? He replied with a beaming smile. Well, I am a journalist. It's my duty to make omens. Good day to you. With that he clapped me on the, sh he, with that, he clapped me on the shoulder and headed off in the direction of the dining car. I followed him and found a few groups of people talking quietly. <clears throat> I sat with Diblovitz, and we passed an awkward few hours as he drank his way through cup after cup of coffee and talked of nothing but his tailor. As we talked, I eavesdropped shamelessly on the other passengers, overhearing a conversation between a young composer and two Parisian ladies who, it transpired, were heading to the same concert in Vienna. I continued to listen, curious for details about that city. My papa says, My papa says it is very dangerous, remarked one girl, remarked one girl whose name, I learned, was Isabel Poitiers. He says the Emperor is spoiling for war. I asked Diblovitz about it, and he nodded sagely. Indeed, Vienna is arming itself at an alarming rate, he sniffed. I'm writing a story about it. They say they will be moving troops out soon. Out to where? <clears throat> He leaned forward. The Ottomans, he murmured. They say they intend to strike. Istanbul. <clears throat> I hurried back to tell my master. A possible route on from Vienna to Istanbul, perhaps. <clears throat> but he seemed indifferent. I do not think war will break out by the day after tomorrow, he observed. So I think we will have to make other plans. I had nothing more to say. We arrived in Munich a few hours later. My character is now suave. We'll have to sleep here and explore in the morning. Okay. The Franco-Prussian War had concluded a year previously. Thus, I flaunted my French accent here in the Victor city. I had no interest in coddling others' sensibilities. That is, until the concierge in our hotel quite deliberately dropped a mug of coffee onto my lap. Quite a sensitive moment for poor Passepartout. I met... Mm. I endured the insult with dignity. Later, Monsieur Fogg congratulated me on my forbearance, declaring simply, quietly, 
Good show. My relationship with Fog has strengthened slightly. Your character, my character, is now presentable. I guess I am. Pass par tout. Explore. There was little daylight in Munich. The sky was shrouded in steam and oil fumes from the tractors and hydraulic excavators in the streets. Workers shouted to each other over the din of construction while the more fastidious citizens wore dark cloaks over their finery. I brushed a few specks of dirt from my collar, absent-mindedly. Far more intrigued by the gleaming machines remarking, remaking the city's skyline. Rumor had it, rumor had it that this work was the doing of the Bavarian king, who had become obsessed with steam power and was spending an exorbitant sum on imported machinery and engineering works. The Kingdom of Bavaria had recently joined the German Empire. It appears that the king suddenly had much more time on his aristocratic hands. Power and free time are a most potent and dangerous combination, as our journey, I fear, proves. Bank. We must visit the bank, Monsieur Fogg declared. Monsieur Fogg declared. You have additional funds? I'm a gentleman. They would extend me credit if required, he replied. But But do you suppose I could put my entire fortune into a carpet bag under your supervision? Of course. I regarded the bank as we entered. It was a palace of stone and shimmering marble floors with beautiful windows, fountains and plants. You wish to withdraw funds, we were, t we were told. I warn you, it may take some time. £1,000 on Monday, £3,000 on Wednesday, £5,000 in a week. We cannot afford even a single day, I declared. We swept out of the bank. Thankfully, our situation is not desperate, my master declared. Onwards. Depart. Path tomorrow? I think this is better. Just going to pause the game a moment. I need to switch off Skype. Or Skype, whatever it is called. Bink. Okay, we are continuing. Um, hmm. Ah. I think we will go here because we get a good j oh. hmm. I think so. A private driver with an oil guzzling Bose car who took off at high speed once we were aboard. I slept the whole way. It seems the best plan to survive the ordeal. Relations with Fogg have strengthened slightly.
Hat sich ja Expedition Remote for North Pole. By midday we had crested the mountains and our journey down was almost steam free. I relished the fresh air and I could see my master did as well. And then there was the Adriatic Sea, sparkling as though encrusted with jewels. Thoughts of grimy London flew from my head. This was the life. In short, the car did not explode, and we were rolled across the gulf to the city of canals. The lamps were just being lit, and we lost ourselves in the narrow, winding alleys, enjoying the smells of grilling fish and red wine, and the sparkle of glass from shop windows. This was a pretty place we had arrived in, indeed. Relations with fog have strengthened slightly. Planning, how do I get back? No, like that, click on him. Let's stay at the hotel then. I was walking along a canal side in Venice when I found myself in the midst of a group of revelers. They were a fabulous array of masks, some beak nosed, others brightly feathered, and even some spun of fine glittering wire. I bowed in greeting and gave them such a surprise that one tripped, turned, and then tumbled into the canal. Her friends seemed drunkenly unconcerned and fell about in peeling laughter as the woman cursed and thrashed in the dark water. I dove to the rescue. Reaching her in a few strokes, zut alors, the water was cold. She kicked and fought as I hauled her to a nearby flight of steps. Fiametta is a daughter of the canal, one of her friends put in. You should have left her in it. Another drunken youth agreed. It's the only time she bathes. Fiametta coughed and choked as I hauled her from the water. I looked her over. Her mask was long gone and her fine clothes ruined, but her eyes gleamed. Who are you? she demanded, seeming to see me for the first time. Her friends made various kissing noises and suggested a variety of improbable roles for me. A clown, one said. No, no, another interjected. An agent of the Pope. Yet another added sotto voce. Fiametta's foreign lover. <coughs> Which caused them all to laugh as Fiametta cast him with admirable thoroughness. <coughs> I introduced myself with a bow. The effect only little ruined by the dipping. Pass partout at your service. And what manner of creature are you, Signor Passepartout? she demanded. I am a valet. And what is that? Some sort of a policeman? she asked. No wonder you throw yourself into canals after innocent citizens. Her friends laughed and I bristled. Farewell, mademoiselle. Do not worry yourself, for I shall, she replied with a wide, unfriendly smile. And so I slipped back to Monsieur Fogg as the revellers opened another bottle of wine to appease their canal-sodden friend. Depart. We left Italy directly, boarding a ferry to take us to Athens via the port of Patras on the east coast. I do hope you're not spending too much money, Passepartout. That money has to last all the way around. I have no idea. Uh -huh. Phileas Fogg attempts a round-the-world adventure. The boat was crowded with room for luggage, 
with little room for luggage or perambulation. So I but with plenty of characters. I fell into a broad conversation with a man named Monsieur Mikos, who worked in Venice but was affiliated or affianced to an Italian girl from a small village in Anatolia. It is best to marry outside of one's own, I tell you, he ensued, for we are all citizens of the world now, are we not? I am sure you are right. Love knows no borders. It does not, he replied, but sadly money does, so I will not be married for some time, I think. What is your work? I asked. I work the ships, the ferries from Athens to Ismir. They're cheap, frequent and fast. Perhaps I'll see you again aboard. Hmm. Passepartout, my good greetings, Monsieur Mikos. Passepartout, my good friends. I've been told the ferries that Ismir are cheap, frequent and fast. Speaking of boats, speaking of boats, I understand one can travel aboard the Persian Gulf ferry from Dubai to Bandar Abbas, but the journey is a tiring one. From Dubai to Bandar Abbas. Mm. Where is Antalya? Hmm. That's, that's Turkey, isn't it? Over here somewhere. Or Izmir to Tehran. That's further. Is it possible to travel from Izmir to Tehran? Look, collectors in Benares will pay fantastic amounts for astrolabes from Tehran. Yeah. Uh, is there a route from Izmir to Antalya? I don't know, but the quickest way to Antalya from here is to go via Ismir. Goodbye. The ferry ploughed on through the sun-dappled waters. I spent my time aboard talking to other passengers, I hoping to gather information for our next leg. I met a remarkably energetic Slavic gentleman. Whom I quickly abandoned as knowing nothing. As evening drew in, the boat turned towards the hovering coastline, and we docked at Patras, where a small fleet of chaffing cars waited to take us across to Athens. My character is now organised. a brief pause there, I'd carry on. Well now, the journey is proving more tiring than I expected. That's, that is the only route. Hope for the best then, huh? My master was not as blue, particularly interested in the fabulous locales and exotic cities we journeyed through. Athens was the exception that proves the rule. His sudden interest was not limited to the city. He fixed me with a look. Do you speak Greek? Not enough to find our way around, I replied, rather prosaically. My master nodded sadly. The demotic variant more commonly spoken on the streets eluded him. We were reduced to asking for directions through a combination of mime, moi, Apposite quotations from Homer, my master, 
and I've remembered flattery, moi encore. We picked our way through the labyrinthine streets of the Platka and up to the Acropoli Apocalypse. Acropolis. 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 <laughs> I checked my watch discreetly. Ruins from the past held no attraction for me, especially when a decent night's sleep hung in the balance. As we stood admiring the architecture, I was rudely knocked into by a small man with thick glasses. My hand flew to my wallet to ensure it was still there, but it was. The man blushed red at my gesture. My apologies, my apologies, he murmured. He murmured. Too occupied by the sight, perhaps, I suggested cheerfully, and the man smiled. I have seen it many times before, though, yes, it is most impressive. He put out his hand to shake. Dimitri Sophos. I am the owner of a <coughs> modest shipping freight company based here. And to where do you sail? I inquired. Sophos smiled and pulled a pamphlet from his jacket that details the routes and timings. The one of most interest was a boat sailing, boat sailing to Cairo, which was leaving the next day. I thanked him. I promised to see him in the morning. He beamed and wobbled away. A man with sea legs, I observed. Monsieur Fogg, still gazing longingly at the Parthenon, did not reply. I doubt he noted a word of the entire exchange. I think this is better here. Double click, right click. How can I depart without choosing a route? Do I have to choose a route? I do not know how to do this. That is the one I want. Go. Click, 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 click. If it goes this way, we will have to sleep here. Okay. Check the times. No, 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 no. 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 Tomorrow at 8 a.m. I think it is better. No. Explore. It took a few hours to explore, investigating the various options for how we might continue our journey. <clears throat> Departs tomorrow. Ah. Hotel. With what remained of the day, I went out to explore a little and entered into a discussion with a nervous Turkish mademoiselle who had lost a monocle, which I helped to recover and who then, in between outbursts of shouting, let it slip that the most efficient way to Luxor is to go via Alexandria. I paid a pound for the information and she nodded and then moved away. Your funds have gone down a touch. Depart. 
embark. <coughs> we found our way to Stoffers' ferry terminal in good time and waved a greeting to the owner who was visiting to inspect his fleet. Passepartout! He cried cheerfully. You will join me, join with me and drink some retzina? Monsieur Fogg lifted an eyebrow but said nothing. That will be most enjoyable. I told him, thinking it might be possible to acquire even faster transportation from this gentleman. My master shook his head just the tiniest fraction before spying a local cafe and placing himself down inside it. This was absurd. I could sense the fury coming off Monsieur Fogg like a wave, even if he, of course, showed nothing whatsoever. Ahem! I put it delicately. I think, in fact, we must be moving on. Sophos nodded. Of course, I, I will not delay you. We clambered aboard Sophos's ferry, finding some space between barrels of olives and large packing crates that smelled of fish. Soon the rope slipped from its ring and we were away. Relations with Fogg have deteriorated slightly. Your character is now well healed. What's this little arrow? Oh. But we are on our way. Greetings, Madame Nicolai. Passepartout, or welcome aboard. I need to know about Caro. Caro is a magnificent place, but it's easy to get lost there. Is it possible to go from Caro to Suez? Yes, but one, one can drive by private car from Cairo to Suez, but the journey is a tiring one. It's possible to go from Suez to Luxor? Please, monsieur, I must go, but I hope we will talk again. Next stop, Cairo and the coast of Africa. The journey was mercifully brief, but perhaps because the crew was so feckless. Only at the last moment did they start to move, swarming the rigging and the masts, and bringing us slowly into the bustling port of Alexandria. As we came ashore, I gasped at the sight of the towering lighthouse that blazed a beacon of incredible golden light across the water. I had understood the lighthouse to be long since destroyed, but I shrugged. No doubt I had misunderstood. The sailors gestured for us to follow. From the port it was a short carriage ride to Cairo, and we arrived in good time. Some of our possessions could earn us well here. The car arrives today. And back. Go. <coughs> no wasting time in Cairo. Eh? What if we miss the ferry from Suez? Or whatever it is. We found the private diver to take us to Suez. <coughs> the journey was quick enough. The roads here in Egypt are surprisingly well maintained and the car itself ran efficiently. I asked the driver how she kept it so well and she smiled with pleasure at the compliment. There are many artificers in here in Egypt, she replied. She replied. There always have been, of course. The guild was founded on the banks of the Nile. Is that so? She nodded she nodded. But of course. But of course, what do you suppose papyrus was invented for but to draw blueprints? She took her eyes from the road a moment to look at me. Then she shook her head and returned her attention to some extremely nimble driving. My character is now zestful. <clears throat> you seem quite a handy man to have about, have around, Passepartout. 
Good gracious, this is rather more, exha more exhausting than I anticipated. <clears throat> Well, I'm planning to go here, and goodness knows what we do when we are at Bombay. Okay, go back. When do we, when do we depart? is late. Let's go to sleep. Xenoformed lamp lighters lit the gas lamps as the sun set over Suez, bathing the wide avenues of the city in a smoky yellow glow. I enjoyed the city without thinking too hard about its curious existence, blooming like a little flower with the desert all around. Does he need a rest? I do not know. When do we depart? And back. Go. <clears throat> so Doc was crowded with people cheering one and another along. There was much. Uh, we, of course, boarded in silence. <clears throat> no one paid us any attention. Or well, now, perhaps not. I fancied I sensed a pair of eyes fixed on us as we made our way aboard the Mongolia. But when I looked around, they were gone. <clears throat> as though whoever had been watching us had quickly ducked away. Oh, a close shave. Superb. I see that button is to tend to Mr. Fogg. Probably I should do that as his valet. The steamer Mongolia was built of iron of 2,800 tons burden and 500 horsepower. She sailed as grandly as a duchess out of the port of Suez. A magnificent sight, I cried, watching the grand hotels and gaslit gardens of the city recede into the distance. <clears throat> Monsieur Fogg looked upon them dismissively. There will be many more such sights to come, for we have quite a distance yet to travel. My master, I was learning, was as unvarying as the ship's chronometers. I confess I found it comforting to serve such a reliable personage. Certainly, he was incurious and perhaps even indifferent, but he was also dauntless. Without doubt, he was an eccentric gentleman upon an even more eccentric quest, but he was my eccentric gentleman, and I was determined to do my duty by him come what may. Relations with Fogg have strengthened. What's that? What's that? I could not wish for a superior valet. I don't know. Is he tired or dying or something? Oh, is there a number of days left? Oh dear. <laughs> Monsieur Fogg spent his days playing whist with Sir Francis, a tall, fair fellow who was an old India hand, as they said in the trade. It seems Sir Francis was travelling the full distance to Bombay. Good town, he declared. He declared. Good artificers, too. On the evening of the second day, we approached the city of Jeddah on the coast of the Gulf. Are we stopping? I asked a sailor, who shook his head. We don't need to refuel so soon, he said. We can get as far as Aden before we need more coal. Still, we appeared to slow down, perhaps simply to prevent our wake from damaging the harbour defences of the town. I was taken by the sudden thought but that perhaps we could put ashore here, and I asked my sailor friend about the matter. We could drop a boat if we had to, he said, if it was an emergency. I nodded and let the idea pass. The Mongolia was to take us far, fast. Indecisiveness was not what Monsieur Fogg would want. <clears throat> Good.
good gracious, this is rather more strenuous than I anticipated. Hmm. A befriended, befriended and extravagantly whiskered fellow passenger who introduced himself to me as Monsieur Fix and evinced a flattering interest in my travels. You are making a tour of the world in 80 days, he exclaimed, eyes wide as saucers. It is a wager, I confirmed mormally, not mournfully. Gentlemen are strange creatures and given to stranger fancies to fill their time. Monsieur Fix looked sudden, suddenly rather shrewd. It must be an expensive business, all this travel. My master is a gentleman, I said repressively, for I considered it gosh to discuss financial matters. Yes, of course, my companion agreed laughingly, though his moustache twitched like a pendulum. All the same, what a singular endeavour. You are in most entertaining, Passepartout. I'm worried that Mr. Fix might be a thief. Monsieur Fix was a most congenial fellow and possessed all of all manner of useful knowledge. I asked him what he knew of. Bombay, the Mongolia's final destination. I was stationed in Bangalore during my time in India, not Bombay, he told me, smiling. I spent much of my time playing cricket. We colonials take the game seriously, almost as seriously as the natives themselves. <laughs> Yeah, English. Ah, the buttons, they disappeared too quickly. I cannot click him. Converse. Greetings, Monsieur Fix. Pass par two, Bombay. There's a large artificers' guild outpost in Bombay. Bombay to Angu, now I want to go to one. I don't like all these questions. Vakna, Matras, Aiden. Ujiji, where the hell is that? No idea, but now Ujiji is a trade hub for Zanzibar and the Zulu Federation's goods, so that's no use. It's back to Africa. What is going on? Is he dying or what? Ah, I see. I need to tend him often and get that number up. Oh. Monsieur Fix dragged me up on deck, saying only, You will not want to miss this, my friend. Through the sea mist, I saw the immaculate city of Aden nestled in the caldera of a volcano, bounded by sheer black cliffs and crystal blue sea. My God, I blasphemed, secure in the knowledge that any passing deity would forgive me given the magnificent sight before my eyes. Perhaps your master would want to see it also, Fix asked. I could send one of the deckhands to fetch him. My master is rarely fetched, I replied a little archly. Indeed not. Indeed not, remarked a voice remarked the voice from behind us, and I turned to see my master emerging from below decks. I made to introduce the two, but neither seemed interested. Monsieur Fix drifting away along the rail, and my master tapping his fingers on the rail with pleasure. The shipping lanes outside Aden were busy. We passed close enough to other steamers to make out individual passengers taking a turn above deck. The little boy leaned over a railing and waved at me, so I waved back and grinned. Monsieur Fogg gave me a look, as if to chide me for making a spectacle of myself, but I was too taken with the child's expression of atlas joy to take my master's disapproval much too hard. And so we began the second and much longer part of our journey to Bombay, a few days which will prove most eventful. I should pause the game here and save it. How do I do that? I do not know. If I say quit, will it just quit? Screenshot. What is that? Zoom. Well, I suppose I must quit. I hope the game is not over if I quit. I, I, I trust it will give me the option to save or do I press escape perhaps? Settings. No. Danger, danger. What happens if I quit? 
Oh my god. Will it just stop or will it ask me to save the game? Before I do that, I will pause the recording and see if I can find out. It looks like there is no actual save setting, so strangely enough, I will just quit and hope when I come back in part two, it will have saved it. So, goodbye for now.